Uh, good afternoon. I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the lecture by this year's Class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellow, Lisa Monaco. Uh, this event is made possible by the generosity of the Class of 1950, which was the first class to have John Sloan Dickey as president uh, for their entire Dartmouth career. And they have been inspired by him to lead lives engaged in world affairs. And for us at the center, this is one of um, the real connections that we have to John Dickey. And we're uh, really grateful uh, for, this, uh, for this bond. Um, if, uh, if all has happened according to plan, I think we have three members of the class of 50 here, uh, Doug, uh, Smith and Meredith Smith, um, his wife, Joe Medlicott and Jim Strickler and his wife Peggy and um, I saw at least two of you moments ago so we're delighted you're here. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> I'm especially delighted that Lisa Monaco is this year's Class of 50 lecturer. Uh, working with Lisa in the first Obama term when she was Assistant Attorney General uh, for National Security at the Department of Justice was one of the highlights of my, times in, uh, my time in government. Uh, she is an incredibly competent civil servant, someone who had served presidents of both parties and had done an extraordinary job and uh, knew the ropes in ways that I could only dream of. And um, she is the kind of civil servant that we don't hear nearly enough about in a culture that seems to be focused on relentless attacks on government. Well, um, suffice it to say that at the end of the first Obama term, she went on to bigger and better things in the White House, and I went on to Dartmouth. And, um, uh, and, and we were both very happy with our choices. Um, but I've been determined to bring her here uh, if she ever escaped the grip of the executive branch, and she has finally done that. So let me give you a little bit more of a formal uh, introduction. Lisa Monaco served as Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism in the White House from 2013 to 2017, uh, which is to say for the entire second term of the Obama presidency. And in this position, she was the uh, handpicked successor to John Brennan, uh, who went on to become Director of the CIA. In this role, she was the President's top advisor on um, terrorism, uh, counterterrorism and uh, homeland security. Uh, but her responsibilities also covered uh, a broad range of cyber issues, um, uh, health emergencies, uh, and natural disasters. And she was therefore at the center of the storm for the Boston Marathon bombing, the Ebola crisis, the many different hackings of the period, the San Bernardino and Orlando attacks, and uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, you know, most uh, riveting, the shocking emergence, rise, and fall of ISIS. Prior to her White House appointment, uh, Lisa spent 15 years in various positions at DOJ, including as, um, as I mentioned, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, uh, in which position she uh, established the first nationwide network of national security cyber specialists and led a division of more than 300 lawyers uh, responsible for uh, national security cases and policy. Uh, before that, um, probably the job that will most be of interest to people here is that she served for three years as counsel and chief of staff to FBI Director Robert Mueller. Uh, before that, she worked as an assistant U.S. attorney, including as a member of the Enron Task Force. Does everyone remember Enron? Okay, because I sort of feel like we're coming full circle here. Um, she is a graduate of Harvard University, where she studied history and literature, and the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, if, those are all, uh, if those are not credentials enough, you should also know uh, that she is a true New Englander. She grew up in uh, Boston and uh, is certainly someone you would want to trust with your national security because she spent her weekend skiing, including competitively at Killington. Uh, she is now a distinguished senior fellow at NYU Law School, uh, a commentator at CNN, and I hope the star of some future very lucky administration. So with that, please welcome Lisa Monaco. So this is great. They're prepared for us. They've got the, <laughs> the tissues in addition to the water. Yes, um, which is very nice. Which I'm is not going nice. to make you cry. <laughs> so. uh, well, you know, there were a few interagency meetings where I was on the verge of it. <laughs> yes, that's um, sure. But anyway, why don't we start with that first thing that was in your title. Um, 
and just talk a little bit about uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. You know, we have seen, um, it appears, the end of the caliphate, um, and to some extent, uh, a big uh, reduction of ISIS. And I'm just uh, curious what you think uh, it all means. Can we uh, relax? Uh, no, it's a short answer. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, first, let me say thank you for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. I've spent really a, a wonderful day meeting with so many terrific students and their professors. Uh, it really has been great to be on campus. And uh, Dan was saying, does it feel like being back in government, going from meeting to meeting to meeting? Yes, um, <laughs> but uh, conversation I mean, not to depress folks, but a lot more interesting today. Uh, and as I remarked to one of the groups I met with, uh, I was really happy to finally be sitting in a room with windows to actually you know, have a conversation in a, in a window room because uh, I spent, as Dan knows, uh, four years in the White House uh, occupying windowless rooms, both my office and the Situation Room, uh, on the litany of issues that Dan uh, indicated in his introduction, uh, which earned me the nickname Dr. Doom from President Obama. It's actually not a lie, it's what he referred to me as, because I would always, whenever I would see him, I was bringing him bad news. Um, and uh, so that, it's nice to be uh, out of that. Uh, yeah, Secretary Clinton always used to say to me, I like you, but I hate it when I see you coming my way. Yeah, that's pretty much the, the reaction I got, although yeah. every morning from President yeah. Obama. So. Um, and I want to thank the class of 1950 for, for um, uh, making my visit possible. So, uh, no, we should not relax. Um, now, that's because somebody who held my job, I think, is probably constitutionally incapable of uh, advising anyone to relax. But in, more seriously, um, you rightly point out the um, eradication of the physical caliphate uh, that ISIS has occupied, and just kind of just step back a little bit. Uh, we're really in a remarkable moment uh, when you look back at where we were in 2014, in the spring and summer of 2014, where ISIS was rolling across, quite literally, rolling across um, Iraq, uh, occupying the major population centers in the, in the largest um, cities in Iraq, uh, physically taking ground and holding it, something we had not seen from a terrorist organization. Uh, something wholly different from what we had been um, uh, dealing with before. And today, they occupy no major population center, uh, and they have really been routed from uh, the physical space that they once occupied. That's the good news. <laughs> uh, ISIS, uh, I think, is best understood as being uh, really three, having three manifestations. Uh, as an insurgent army, in the way that I just described, occupying physical space, uh, as a terrorist group organizing, recruiting, training, and sending off for complex attacks like we saw in Paris and Brussels, et cetera. Uh, that would be the second manifestation. And thirdly, and I think most is what distinguishes it the most, as a social movement, really, in the way it has inspired, taken over, uh, and exploited um, social media uh, and the internet uh, to inspire others to violence. And so as to the first manifestation, we're doing very, very well. We've pushed them back. They no longer occupy a physical caliphate. That success, however, as I mentioned uh, to the last group of students I, mentioned, uh, I met with this afternoon, that success against the physical caliphate is necessary but not sufficient for our overall uh, defeat of ISIS. And the other two manifestations notably as a terrorist group and a social movement, uh, we're not where we need to be. And indeed, uh, they've been pushed out of the population centers I mentioned, but uh, I think there's reason to think that they are burrowing in uh, and will undertake a more clandestine, uh, asymmetric approach. And by that, I mean uh, projecting their power outward in other areas. We've seen uh, really a heinous suicide attack in Baghdad just last month, killing, I think, um, you know, uh, some 300 individuals, if I'm not mistaken, the largest uh, amount, in similar attack in Egypt. Um, so trying to deploy and project this power out precisely because they've lost so much ground. So I think, you know, the, the real challenge will be, what is our strategy to address 
the second and third manifestations uh, of ISIS. It's um, a determination to project power outward in other areas uh, to include uh, beyond the Middle East and North Africa, Indonesia and other areas. And most importantly, I think from a homeland perspective, to address their continuing ability to inspire individuals to violence without doing any type of travel uh, or training. <clears throat> so um, you've uh, served back a big softball. <laughs> we are pretty good at counterterrorism around the world, uh, often as good as our partners are. Yeah. Or, or, dependent on our partners, but that, uh, that part of the equation that's about inspiring others uh, to do things, um, I don't know, I'd give us, uh, having worked on it for four years, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd give us pretty low grades. Yeah. And um, uh, I'd be interested in your thought if we are even headed in the right direction. So I, I think you're, you're right in terms of, like any good professor, like. I don't know if you've graded us on a curve there, <laughs> but um, look, you uh, were responsible for and showed great leadership in uh, something called the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which had the counter messaging piece as a, uh, as a very important initiative under Secretary Clinton that Dan led, um, that had the counter messaging piece as a, as a um, very important part of it. What I would say on this issue of addressing the inspirational uh, part of uh, ISIS efforts, that we as a government um, have had a few false starts, quite frankly. And that is because we initially tried to, um, frankly, be a messenger to counter message against ISIS. Uh, that proved to be a bad strategy, quite frankly, uh, because the Anytime what we learned is anytime you have a government stamp on the message that is trying to counteract ISIS propaganda, you're going to be losing that war, that messaging war, because you, you don't have a lot of, the government does not have a lot of legitimacy, and it's not going to have a lot of resonance if, if we were, quote, tweeting back at terrorists with a USG stamp on that messaging, right? It sounds kind of ridiculous when you say it, which is why you're all laughing, right? Um, so what we did is we said, we need to kind of step back at this and really look at what is resonating in the ISIS messaging. So we actually tried to overhaul our efforts uh, in the second term, and we recruited a bunch of experts from Silicon Valley, from Madison Avenue, branding experts, and they kind of dissected, they looked at the messaging that ISIS was using. And they kind of dissected it and said, what these guys are doing is not inspiring individuals to violence with beheading videos. That's not actually what was resonating. What they said was they are recruiting individuals with themes of strength and warmth. I'll never forget getting this briefing actually in the Situation Room from these folks. And they kind of laid it out, and it made total sense when you think about it. They were enticing young people, uh, including here in the United States. They were drawing them in with visions of utopia and belonging. Uh, and what we discovered is what was going to be useful and effective in combating that was not getting into a religious kind of debate with the US government saying, well, you're being un-Islamic, which, by the way, I think is, is true. ISIS does not represent uh, Islam, which is a, a religion of peace. Uh, but it's not very effective to have me standing on the White House lawn saying that into a camera. What is effective, we found, was getting individuals disaffected voices. In other words, individuals who'd been recruited, who traveled to Iraq and Syria, and realized that instead of engaging in some utopian vision of self-governance, they were being handed a broom, or worse, being asked to perpetrate horror on innocence. And so pointing out those facts and debunking ISIS claims was really what was going to be more effective, but not if the USG was doing it. And so what we did is we 
said, let's, let's create an effort, we have it in the State Department, um, to help bring those who can be legitimate messengers, people from non-governmental organizations, civil society, from uh, outside of the United States, pair them with technological experts and social media platforms and people who can get those messages out on social media and try and um, amplify the voices that would actually be good rebuttals to ISIS messaging. So we did all that. Um, and we uh, funded those efforts. Uh, I worry that having engaged in a lot of false starts and having done, I think, some good learning and self-reflection on this, that uh, those, those efforts are not being advanced now. Well, um, I mean, they actually, Secretary Tillerson was withholding the funding that was appropriated for it. It's true. There was yeah. money that we <clears throat> saw it in the budget was actually appropriated, um, and it has not been used. Now, I will say, it's not a partisan statement, there is slippage in every, from every administration to another, but uh, I do think that this is an area that needs prioritization, um, precisely because all of the good work from the last administration continuing into this one to um, deprive ISIS of its physical caliphate needs to be mirrored by depriving it of its digital safe haven. And that is the work uh, we really need to get about doing. So <clears throat> let's come down from the high planes of policy for one moment. You were in the job for all of three weeks when the Boston Marathon happened. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. was that like? <laughs> so a few folks have heard this story today, but um, <coughs> Sorry. The, I was, it was my third week on the job, and uh, I, I kind of used this week, this description of this week, to really describe what the job was all about. You know, because you had to sit in a lot of these meetings, but the breadth that Dan talked about, I think, is best encapsulated uh, with a description of what this, my third week on the job was like. I began the, um, the, day that week, it was April 13th, 2013, um, April 15th, sorry, 2013, and I began the day in the morning assembling um, the deputy secretaries from around the government to uh, deal with an issue that we were seeing coming out of China. You say, what's the Homeland Security Advisor doing talking about China? Well, what we were seeing was a new strain of flu that was erupting um, in uh, China called H7N9. It's actually still out there and actually quite concerning. And we were very worried that it was going to stop from spreading only amongst birds and actually make the jump to human transmission, which is still my nightmare scenario, by the way, for a new strain of flu, but that's for another uh, uplifting topic later, perhaps, in the discussion. Um, so that's how I began my day. Uh, later in the afternoon, I was on the phone with my UK counterpart, and I looked up at my TV, and there was uh, CNN on mute, and it said, bombs have gone off at the Boston Marathon bombing. Hung up on my colleague, and immediately started working the phones, talking to Bob Mueller, John Brennan, to say, what do we know? And uh, minutes later, I was up in the Oval Office trying to describe to the president what had happened, what we knew, which was very, very little at the time, um, and what we were doing, uh, what we didn't know, and immediately talking with him about what he should say to the American people. Um, you had mayhem, I'm sure a lot of you remember seeing these pictures, and immediately trying to make sense out of what was going on and talk to the American people about it. Uh, what a lot of people forget about that week is the next day, there was actually a ricin attack on Congress. There was, uh, live ricin was mailed to several members of Congress. The, uh, the envelope, we discerned, had gone through a mail facility that also serviced the White House. So that was another wrinkle that uh, had to deal with. Um, and then the rest of the week entailed other um, crises, including the continued manhunt for the Boston Marathon bombers. And I found myself on that Thursday night, early into fr that Friday morning of that week, um, uh, receiving word from the Situation Room that there had been a carjacking in 
uh, suburban Boston, uh, and that an MIT police officer had been killed. And normally, it's not the kind of thing that the Situation Room would have called me to wake me up about. But folks will remember we had issued um, a picture of two guys, one in a white baseball cap and one in a black baseball cap. And there was reporting that the guys who had done this um, uh, carjacking and killing of the MIT police officer resembled the picture. And so we knew something was up. I again was on the phone with Bob Mueller. Uh, a few hours later, he calls to tell me that they were certain that one of the Boston Marathon bombers was dead and the other one was on the run. And I had to decide right then and there, and it was, as I've told others, it was a pretty easy decision at the time, to wake up the president. It was 3.30 in the morning, and my third week on the job, and he was going to get woken up by me uh, because it was a public safety issue. We had a guy that we didn't know what his plans were. They'd been talking about potentially going to New York, and we didn't know what uh, was in the offing. So uh, it was a pretty clear call by me to call the president and wake him up. And then, of course, folks know how that story ends. But um, the sheer breadth of the information that you have to manage and um, decide, OK, what does the president need to know? Um, what's my level of confidence in this information? How can I help him make sense of it? How can I help him uh, communicate that to the public? both to quell panic as well as to inform. Um, and all the while, um, my uh, brother lives near the Boston Marathon finish line. And my, was my oldest brother and my twin brother uh, would regularly go uh, see the race. So um, you know, had that in the back of my mind as well. So I got to ask, did you ever wake up the president and have him say, you know, you didn't need to wake me up? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, he may have been thinking it, but yeah. uh, no. And, that, and it certainly wasn't, uh, certainly that wasn't the case that time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, I, people don't believe me when I say this, but that was really, um, I did not, it, it didn't occur to me not to wake him up on, on that one. And when you're going through all this, setting aside waking up the president, but when you're going through all this, of course, you're also wondering, is there an international dimension to this? Oh, for sure. I mean, that was one, <clears> of, the, <throat> one of the things, right? We didn't know um, where this was directed from, who it was directed from, whether it was part of a larger series of events. I mentioned the ricin attack. Um, in the early stages of that, we had no idea if that was connected or unconnected to the Boston Marathon bombings. Folks will recall uh, after 9-11, we had the anthrax attacks. Same series of questions, right? Were these things related? Um, so yeah, it was, um, there was more, uh, more gaps in our knowledge by far than, uh, than anything else at that time. Right. So uh, it's, it's uh, good to talk about the, that attack. It was one of the sort of three major domestic attacks, I guess, uh, uh, during that four-year period. And you know, it, it did grip us all, yeah. and uh, understandably because it's a national event, you know, Patriots Day in Boston, so on and so forth. Um, if you step back from that and you look at the macro picture of how we're doing about against terrorism, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a little misleading because you know we actually mark our lives by when these events happen, what we were yeah. doing, so on and so forth. Um, and yet, if you look at the period since 9/11. We've had roughly 110 deaths, hmm. roughly 110 uh, people killed in the United States by jihadist terrorists. Uh, no one in this room needs to have thrown at them the number of people who die every year uh, from handguns, for example, or uh, in car accidents, things like that. You know, so uh, three, th whatever it is, a thousand, three thousand times that number. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the question is, um, you know, <clears throat> in an era when everyone is very, very critical of big government, isn't it fair to say that, you know, we've actually done a pretty good job here? And relatedly, is our failure, our failure, you, you and I as, as former government stiffs, or our, our elected leadership, both in, in uh, the White House and in Congress, uh, that there hasn't been the public education to say, 
It was legitimate to worry about another 9-11 in 2003, 2004, whatever. But let's think of where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, how, as a policymaker, do you deal with that paradox? Well, it, it was when this very front and center, particularly in the time that you referenced, in the 2014 to, to um, 2016 period, where we were seeing ISIS on the rise. We saw such horrific uh, images coming out of uh, Syria with the brutal, brutal murder of brave journalists and aid workers, um, many of whose um, families I got to know personally who were, had been held hostage and brutally murdered. Um, in the face of those images, um, I think you're hard pressed to make the argument to that family or any other that um, you know uh, they should recognize all of our efforts and you know we should be credited with uh, stopping another 9/11. Uh, it is true we have done I think uh, exceptional work owing to dedication by the military diplomats, law enforcement, intelligence, and other officials from across multiple administrations uh, to build up an architecture and a capability and expertise um, to make sure we don't have another 9-11. And this is the part in which I always knock wood, because you'll never get somebody in, who worked in my job or you in yours who is ever sanguine about that. Um, but we do need to. Uh, kind of take stock of where we are now. And you know, I think we are in what I've described as a new phase in this war on terrorism. And it is one where I think we cannot be um, complacent about another externally directed complex style attack like we saw in 9-11. Uh, there are still terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda in Syria, the largest affiliate of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda core that hit us on 9-11. Largest affiliate is Al-Qaeda in Syria operating in the chaos and safe haven that is Syria today. Um, and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, ISIS also has elements that is bent on doing more complex and externally directed attacks. So we cannot take our eye off that ball. But we've got to recognize where this threat has morphed to and shifted to. And I would argue it's a much more challenging problem because while we have built up a structure and an architecture, and one could argue a net, to catch the next 9-11, externally directed, intelligence driven, to detect that type of sleeper cell complex attack, we do not have the similar type of structure to detect what goes wrong in somebody's mind and he gets into the cab of a truck and drives down the West Side Highway. What goes wrong in somebody's mind, and he uses a legally purchased firearm to mow down 50 people in a nightclub, right? So how do we tackle those threats when there's individuals who, as far as we know, undertook no travel, no sophisticated training, no external direction from an international group, um, but yet became radicalized largely from consuming, um, or at least in part, from consuming um, poison on the internet. How do we get at that? How do we, as a government, engage with communities to help us fight that threat? Because that is where this struggle now is. Um, uh, and that's, that's a challenge that, that we haven't created that architecture for yet. So I completely agree uh, with the way you laid it out and on the need to uh, uh, get into communities and uh, do a better job at identifying the person who's at risk of radicalization. One thing that our politics hasn't allowed for anymore, though, is the notion that there's just an ineradicable margin of okay. violence in the society. People go off their rockers and, yeah. you know, we... we the biggest killing you know, in, in ages was in Las Vegas by someone who had yeah. no ideology. Right. Um, and yet, if it is carried out by a Muslim, if it, yes. has, um, <clears throat> if it has any hint of ideology attached to it, yep. it's national hysteria. Yeah. Look, I mean, there's, there's a few things going on here. You, you're, you're quite right in that description. 
this was a, it's a struggle though for the policymakers and the, and the people who have to articulate this and for the president and others. Um, you know, this question about, well, more people die in their bathtubs than die from um, terrorist violence. It may be a factual statement, but my own view is that as somebody who is responsible for homeland security, making that very exceptionally rational argument is not really advancing the homeland security effort. Because if you're not addressing people's fears and trying to make a hyper-rational argument to them, I don't think you're really gonna be advancing the ball. So on the one hand, the numbers are absolutely um, as you laid them out, but if we don't uh, kind of meet people where they are in their fear, I had lots of people, I would tell you, at the height of um, the images coming out of Syria with the um, hostages who were killed and others, uh, those brutal images, I had lots of people, some of whom quite expert in international relations and foreign policy who worked in government, who told me that they, their children were asking them whether ISIS was gonna come kind of get them in their beds. I mean, this is, this is the type of fear that was gripping people. Now, is it rational? Maybe not. But if we as policymakers don't address that fear, uh, I think we're not uh, doing our job. So that is what we had to confront and had to, uh, had to address by saying, look, we are um, addressing the, the scourge of ISIS in a myriad uh, of ways, military, um, intelligence, diplomatic, law enforcement, uh, the counter messaging I mentioned. Um, because if the public doesn't believe you're trying to address what they are fearful of legitimately or not, you're losing, you're gonna lose that battle. Um, well, let's talk about how we um, fight yeah, the counter. Can I say one more thing on of that course. score? Of um, course. You know, I think it shouldn't be lost though in, we talked about all these, these um, the attacks, you mentioned Boston, San Bernardino, all these other places. You know, it is true that um, these types of attacks gain great resonance and um, are fodder for lots of cable news, et cetera. But it is also the case that those communities have shown tremendous resilience. Right, and so the Boston Marathon bombing, um, yes, it, it gripped that city uh, for that week, but you know the people came back, they ran the marathon again, San Bernardino, same thing. I mean, I get asked a lot, are these attacks something that we should be just recognize as a new normal? So it goes to your point about this, you know, is there this irreducible level of violence that we're just gonna have to tolerate? My own view is that is true that there will be more of these style of attacks because there's a low barrier to entry, they're low tech, uh, it, they're very hard to detect for all the reasons I said, but we should not confuse our resilience to those attacks with resignation that they're just gonna keep coming. I think if we do that and we resign ourselves to the level of violence that we've seen in some of these places, you know, that's not a good place to be. I think that's well put. So what, let's just talk for a minute about <clears throat> how we do counterterrorism, because one way in particular has, has aroused a lot of public concern, and that has to do with drones. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us who've, uh, you know, worked around this issue, um, you know, we don't think that drones are, are by any means a panacea, but they're pretty damn useful. And uh, they've made an enormous, they've been game changers uh, yeah. in, in, the, uh, in the effort. And uh, you know, I think most of us who were in government around this issue also felt that uh, they yielded um, more precision rather than less in terms of the use of force, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is regrettable at any time, but if you can do it and affect fewer people, then, then so much the better. Um, <clears throat> do you, having you know, been up close with this for all these years, still feel that way? Um, do you feel that we have, you know, sort of moral right on our side doing this? Um, are there any things you worry about in terms of the long-term usage of uh, unmanned uh, uh, aerial vehicles? So I think 
this is one of the hardest issues we dealt with. Um, and I, I come down to a similar place where, as you just described. Um, the, I am convinced of the utility of this tool when used um, with constraints and um, pursuant to kind of a framework uh, that we put in place. I'm, um, I am persuaded by the precision, by and large, of the tool. Um, but I am also persuaded that we need to constantly be reevaluating the constraints and the checks that we're putting on the use of this tool, not only for our own kind of prosecution of this fight, but because, and this is one of the reasons uh, the president put in place a, a, a policy, set of policy guidelines that uh, I think we can talk about, um, not only for our own use, but because this is technology that is proliferating, right? We are not the only users of this tool. And if we do not set some guardrails and some norms as to how we are using it, um, you know, it's Katie bar the door for other countries, which is not to say that countries will look at us and say, okay, we'll do what you're doing. But it is important to, to kind of articulate some leadership in this space. So that was really how President Obama looked at it and is now, a lot of this was shrouded in secrecy for many years, but um, there has been um, more declassification and transparency around this issue. But um, you know, President Obama put in place a framework and a set of policy guidelines for how we would use this tool. And what he said is the legal floor for the use of the tool is not the only thing that's going to be a constraint on us. In other words, um, the target must be a lawful one, terrorist target engaged in hostilities with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, where both by recognition of both domestic and international law, we are on the right side of the law by undertaking uh, to disrupt that threat using force, including armed drones. But what he said was being legally OK is not sufficient. And what we did is adopted a framework that said we also were going to require a policy threshold be met. First, it's got to be legal. That's the first thing. But then the question is, does that target present such a threat that we should be using this tool? Does the, the place where we're using it, that the country where we're using this, uh, outside of active military hostilities, um, is that, are we doing so with the consent of that government? Uh, if not, is it because they are unwilling or unable um, to address that threat? And is it such a threat that we have to act in the interest of protecting the United States? And importantly, the framework President Obama required that his administration use required that there be near certainty that in taking that strike, no civilian could be injured or killed in the course of that strike. Now, is that to say that there have been no mistakes or no civilian casualties in the course of conducting counterterrorism operations? Absolutely not. That's not the case. But it is the case that um, the policy guidelines that we operated under was to adopt the highest standard that we could possibly adopt, which is near certainty that we not uh, kill any civilians in the course of these counterterrorism strikes. This is, you know, this is a really difficult and important legal, moral, ethical space. Um, but as you know from being part of these discussions, Dan, you know, our leaders, particularly in the military and elsewhere, will be the first ones to tell you that it is important that we operate with this kind of precision. Because when we are using force and doing so with our military, um, you know, we should be occupying the high ground. And we should be holding ourselves to a higher standard than other, um, other countries and other militaries. Um, because in doing so, we're going to be um, you know, operating through our, through our values as well as through domestic and international law. And that 
uh, is going to help reduce the threat as well. And, and help create norms too. Yeah. I mean, others will be um, <clears throat> leery of uh, you know, wanton violence. So um, there are a million things to touch on. There are just a couple that I want to get to before we saying open it up. My answer should be shorter. Yeah. I think no, that's no, no. <laughs> um, so we should talk about cyber. Mm -hmm. And we could talk about all the fun hacks that you <laughs> live through. I particularly like the Sony one because it was filled with such good gossip that the North Koreans let us all read about. But um, you know, the biggest hack of all was the hack of the election. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I guess um, this is also a, um, a relevant time to be bringing it up because today was um, a sort of um, Washington's equivalent of Halloween in that it's the global threat warning that's given out. Mm -hmm. And so everyone gets as, becomes as scary as they possibly can become. No. Uh, and this happened in the Senate uh, Select Intelligence Committee today. Uh, <clears throat> and um, all of the, the Director of National Intelligence and all of the heads of uh, the different uh, agencies uh, said the Russians think that uh, the 2016 was a great success and they can't wait to have that in 2018 and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's kind of depressing. Um, what, uh, what's your view of, uh, have, have, we, uh, have we accomplished nothing since uh, 2016? And, and I mean, you were on the job. What was it like to be seeing this come in as, uh, you know, th throughout 2016, really? You know, look, this, this was a uh, kind of an unprecedented issue that we were grappling with, right? right? Um, you know, you had the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Homeland Security on October 7th of 2016 issue an unprecedented statement on an unprecedented issue. And they said um, that we believe that Russia was behind the hack of the DNC emails. And it was done with um, the knowledge and direction of the highest levels of the Russian government. Um, and uh, you know, that was put out on October 7th um, in you know, what was before then probably kind of an unfathomable uh, thing that we've been issuing that statement. Um, and you know, there's been lots of discussion about, well, you know, was the Russian effort to help one candidate hurt another candidate? Whatever uh, else uh, has been discussed about that, there was unanimity amongst the intelligence community that Russia's, one of Russia's goals in doing this was to sow discord, cause confusion, uh, cause uncertainty about our democratic process. And look, they succeeded. They succeeded in doing all of that. Um, it is also the case, and we said this both um, before and after the election, we saw no indication of a um, effect on the voter outcome or the, the vote outcome in terms of the tabulation of the votes, right? I want to be very clear about that. We, you know, the intelligence community never concluded and saw no indication of an effect on the actual vote itself, right? Uh, in terms of interference with the vote count. Um, but the discord and confusion um, and polarization that, we're, that we have seen both before and since, uh, I think is what has formed the basis for the intelligence community's assessment that yes, uh, Russia believes it's, it's been quite successful. And uh, I do not think that we have done enough to address it happening again. Uh, we've got, including today, um, the current, I think, Director of National Intelligence and head of the CIA saying what uh, their predecessors have since said, which is um, they are coming back. They're in the process of coming back. They will do this again, having uh, reaped success. Um, and uh, they fully anticipate, I think it was uh, DNI Coates and Pompeo who said today that they are, uh, will target the midterm elections. I think we have every reason to believe that that would be the case. Um, so I don't think that we have focused sufficiently in the last year on what we need to do to prevent that and to prevent that impact. Uh, and I think that there's at least three things that we should be doing. 
First is we should be recognizing what Russia did and is doing and calling it out and being unified in that description. Second is we should be imposing costs on Russia. More costs, continuing costs, and ratcheting up those costs um, for what they have done and, and continue to do. That's sanctions, that's messaging, that's calling it out, that's being very clear and exposing what they're doing. Um, and the third thing is we ought to be doing a lot more to help state and local entities shore up their uh, election systems. There are 3,000, some 3,000 counties across this country. Just think of how and where you go and vote. You go to your local high school, your church, wherever. Um, none of that is in federal hands. The federal government cannot and should not, frankly, be able to wave a wand and fix uh, and take over the voting infrastructure. That is one of the great things about our democracy is that is locally um, uh, driven and controlled. But we need to be um, doing a lot more to shore up the cybersecurity of that infrastructure and things like voter registration databases. Uh, and unfortunately, we have not had unanimity in Congress for that. You focused on the voting process. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> have we gotten to the point where because of fake news that, uh, uh, that there's almost a national security interest in protecting a free press and, and uh, weeding out uh, a lot of the garbage that gets circulated? Look, I think um, it's, you know, we're learning a lot more just in the last year than we, than we knew this time last year about the volume uh, and the number of eyeballs that consumed this stuff from Russian bots and troll farms and the like. Uh, and I think we are just at the beginning of understanding how we consume that stuff, what resonance it has. I said this earlier today, but you know, we focus a lot in this country on uh, the need for STEM education, which I believe is true. Uh, but I think we also need to be doing more on basic civics and analytic rigor and, um, you know, helping educate uh, particularly young people about how they're consuming stuff online uh, and discerning um, the wheat from the chaff. So you would say, go liberal arts. We need you now. I would say that. <laughs> I'm all for that. But I'm also that an avowed math uh, phobe, so, you know. You're a math phobe, yeah. <laughs> Um, do you think that, uh, so one of your predecessors here, our previous visitors, was uh, uh, our, our mutual friend Michael Morell, and he mm -hmm. said that he thought that the administration underreacted to the hack. How do you uh, take that? Look, I think Michael's a very, very thoughtful guy and worked um, many years with him, and so he's, uh, he's very thoughtful on these issues. I, look. There have been questions about, you know, was an intelligence failure? I think both John Brennan and, and Jim Clapper have, have rejected that, and I, and I think that's fair to reject it as a kind of traditional intelligence failure. I do think, as I just said, we know a lot more today than we did at the time about the volume of information uh, and the number of people that saw it on social media now that we've seen more coming uh, forward from the platforms, Facebook and the like. Um, I think that, you know, we were faced with, as I said, an unprecedented situation. We made um, this unprecedented public statement in October, uh, the same day, by the way, as the bully, Billy Bush tape came out. People forget this, that October 7th statement that I mentioned that the Director of National Intelligence and uh, Secretary of Homeland Security called out uh, Russia for their meddling uh, quickly got drowned out by uh, the Billy Bush uh, tape, so in the Access Hollywood tape. So that's um, uh, regrettable is an understatement. But um, so, you know, we took a number of steps uh, to make very public what we believed was going on. Um, I would also say, though, the thing that we tried very hard to do that we did not succeed in was presenting a unified front and message to the country and to the world. 
on this issue. What do I mean by that? I mentioned earlier that Russia, we were unified in our view that Russia was trying to sow discord in our election process in our democracy. And we believe very strongly that in uh, that moment that the greatest rebuttal and defense against those efforts, against somebody trying to divide us, was to show unity and to present a unified bipartisan uh, message about what was going on. And we sought that. Uh, and unfortunately, where I think we had a failure was in some of the institutions of our government, our, our uh, multiple branches of government trying to work together to show a unified bipartisan message that we should not tolerate Russian interference in our elections, that we should uh, band together across party lines to help shore up state election systems. Um, those efforts were met with skepticism and put in a partisan lens, unfortunately, uh, when we tried to undertake them in the fall of 2016. So we've been really good at talking substance. Mm -hmm. I know that most people have remained here because they wanted you to answer this question. What's Bob Mueller really like? <laughs> uh, you know, he's sort of, uh, he's sort of a, a, a Greta Garbo for our times because we see him <laughs> everywhere and yet we never hear him speak. Now, we know him a little, so, but anyway, you, why don't you tell us? Um, Look, I think uh, I'm not going to be able to get that visual out of my head. <laughs> Bob is Greta Garbo. Um, what people should understand about Bob Mueller is um, he is a public servant. Um, he is a decorated uh, Vietnam War veteran who signed up, volunteered to go to Vietnam after graduating from Princeton because his uh, older classmate, um, who was a teammate of his, uh, went to war and was killed. And he, this is a man who is, lives public service, right? And so the, the caricatures of he and his team of being politically driven or this or that, um, it is, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I am admittedly biased. Um, I have uh, the utmost respect uh, for Bob Mueller, and working with and for him was one of the best things I think I will ever have done in my career. Um, but people should understand the nature of the public servant that he is and has been throughout his career. This guy who um, I think stayed in private law practice for a nanosecond or a half a nanosecond because he just he couldn't get behind it, right? right. He um, went back to what we call the line as being a line prosecutor, um, prosecuting homicides in DC after he occupied um, a uh, presidentially appointed position in the Justice Department. So he is a public servant. Now, it is also the case that he is a man of few words and uh, is extremely serious and driven and mission focused. Um, and you know, there was many, many a morning when I was his chief of staff, when I swear he had left the office six, eight hours before and had come back 6.30 in the morning when we began our terrorism briefings. And he'd come in my office and he'd put his briefcase down in the empty chair in front of my desk, say, what's going on? I'm like, I, I just left you like six hours ago. What do you mean what's going on? Um, he is, uh, driven, but you have to understand, he took over the FBI five days before 9-11. He thought he was taking over an organization that became, and with a mission, that totally changed. Our world upended and changed, and he had to lead that organization. So um, he is somebody who also is, grew up in the Justice Department, um, trained as a prosecutor and as a lawyer, believing to his bones that the Justice Department and the FBI must remain independent and free of political influence to do its job, to be sure, but to have the confidence of the American people that it's doing its job. And those things should be distinguished and, and be clear. We need to be clear about them. So, um, you know, 
people should have confidence in the work that he is doing, not because you want a particular outcome, but because I believe that we, as a country, will be able to have confidence in whatever that outcome is because his role and the role of his team is to find facts and to follow the facts and the law however it shakes out. Let's have some questions. Please wait for the mic. One right over here, Sarah. But you address the international law precedent for using drone strikes, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how you would reconcile that with the terrorist dilemma, so further radicalization of groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that based on the international law definition, it would set a really bad precedent for other countries, other nations, but for insurgent groups and terrorist groups, uh, I just wanted your take on that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, if I understand your question correctly, um, the, the framework that I described was, and the standards that were applied, were um, both because of the legal and policy uh, requirements that the president and his national security team believed should apply, but also because we thought that in exercising that restraint or operating within that framework, we'd have um, fewer civilian casualties to be sure, and thereby um, have less backlash from the local population for the strikes that were being undertaken. Because I think a lot of people very rightly point out, if you're using this tool, do you risk creating more terrorists by the reaction of the local community than you are removing from the battlefield, right? And that is a balance and, a, and something that motivated our thinking um, uh, continually as we develop this policy. How about right here? And then... Um, so on the same lines, um, you, the way you're talking about the drone strike uh, guidelines, uh, specific the, specifically the Obama administration, um, there are definitely rumblings that the Trump administration is changing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that he's in Yemen, he's using drone strikes three times as much as Obama did. Civilians are dying at a much faster rate. Um, how does that sort of inform what you're talking about? I mean, because I understand that in the Obama administration, there definitely was sort of a good precedent set uh, but moving forward, uh, how, how is this going to affect sort of insurgency and radicalization? So um, this kind of gets at a few of the themes that I talked to some of the classes about today, which is, um, you know, this balance of how public should a government be about the work that it's doing, the national security steps that it's taking, the tools it's using, et cetera. And over time, um, the Obama administration um, decided to try and be more transparent. Not perfect. Um, and, uh, but one of the reasons was to lay out, OK, look, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is how we're doing it. So that the next team um, would have something to be measured against, quite frankly. And people like yourself could say, well, OK, the Obama administration said that they were doing it this way. We haven't seen a policy statement or a set of guidelines or whatever, you know, for the next administration. How do you compare, right? Setting a, as Dan said, setting norms, articulating a policy doesn't mean that the next administration should follow that policy or has to follow that policy. That's what elections are about. But it does give the public something to say, okay, are you going to deviate from this? Are you going to adopt this? Are you going to change it? It's something to measure against. Um, and increasingly, I think we felt that was important. It's one of the reasons we decided in uh, 2016 to articulate and set up a process whereby every year the intelligence uh, director 
lays out the number of civilian casualties that have arisen in the course of counterterrorism operations. Um, and so we set that bar and we started announcing those numbers um, so that in the future, somebody can, you know, somebody like yourself can say, well, are you going to announce your numbers? And then the administration can make a decision whether they are or not, but at least you're having a semi-informed discussion uh, with the public about it. Has the Trump administration formally said it's not going to release numbers, or they just haven't said anything at all? They, I don't think they've said anything at all. Um, there, was a, there was an article in the New York Times several months ago that the Trump administration was contemplating um, releasing its own revised set of uh, guidelines for the use of uh, drones in counterterrorism operations. I don't believe that that mm. has been issued yet. I wonder if you uh, could hazard a guess about whether uh, Netanyahu's days are numbered or not. <laughs> you know, I, it's inter I just saw that news report um, as I was coming in here that I guess the uh, Israeli uh, prosecutors have indicated. I, I just read the, the alert on my phone, so I would not be hazarding a very informed guess, but it, it did strike me as um, something I'd never seen before um, with Older regard to... Numbered, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's great to get um, the perspective of someone with your type of experience in government. I have a really simple question for you. Uh, do you have any concerns about the militarization of the American police forces? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. It's not actually a, it's a topic that was um, much discussed a couple of years ago. Um, Look, this, like most things, I think, um, bears coming back and looking at, right? So we, we got to this question of, um, you know, whether there was too much military equipment and um, kind of um, uh, ratcheting up the capabilities of police forces uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I come down on this that um, there's, there are going to be situations where police forces need um, some extraordinary capabilities. Uh, I do not think, in, in terms of SWAT teams and the like, to deal with hostage situations and you know, what we saw in Las Vegas, uh, I do not think that every, um, every municipality needs those types of capabilities. Um, but we ought to be informed, as, as we were, by the experts, both law enforcement, uh, civil rights activists, and others, about what impact having that kind of show of force is going to have when you're trying to keep the peace, right? So I think, I guess it's a long way of saying, I think it's actually less about the equipment than about the strategies and the relationship and trust that a police force has with the community when they're called upon to actually try and keep the peace, um, whether it's a Charlottesville situation or, 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 or something else. So uh, during your tenure at the White House, Edward Snowden obviously uh, released a lot of classified information. Um, how do you view the, the relationship between civil liberties, uh, surveillance, counterterrorism, um, and mainly what was your, your personal view on Edward Snowden releasing, um, um, you know, basically being a whistleblower or you know, an enemy of the state? Um, I've said this uh, in other settings and actually wrote a blog post uh, for the White House. Uh, there was a period during the Obama, actually most of the Obama administration where you could basically write in uh, to the White House and say, you know, we think there ought to be a petition that, you know, everyone should see Star Wars or, ever, I mean, and if you got a certain amount of numbers in that petition category, you got a response from somebody in the White House. I responded to the Edward Snowden uh, petition that he should be pardoned. I do not think he should be pardoned. I think he um, violated the law. He had an obligation um, to uh, handle classified information, and if he believed something was uh, not being uh, done 
lawfully or appropriately, or that uh, he had he felt that there was um, misuse of authorities. That there were channels for that, um, and he's a subject of a criminal charge, uh, and I think that he should come home and be prosecuted in criminal court and have his day in court because we do have a criminal justice system uh, that provides uh, protections for someone to get uh, a robust defense. It's not a popular, a universally popular view, I will tell you. Um, I've gotten lots of um, you know, angry commentary on Twitter when I first wrote this blog piece, but uh, I believe in our criminal justice system and he's the subject of a uh, criminal indictment um, and uh, he should face justice for that. Can I, can I just ask a quick follow-on to that? <clears throat> Maybe it has more to do with where I live than anything else, but whenever I, <clears throat> I, I want to compare experiences with you, whenever I suggest to people that, in fact, the U.S. government is not reading every email mm -hmm. or listening to every conversation, I'm look, looked at with um, incredulity. <laughs> um, what do we need to do to get the, that word out? Or is it just, uh, is that, is the, you know, the animals are gone and the barn door is closed? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's uh, explained. We, we confronted this in addressing the, uh, in the height of the Snowden disclosures and how to talk about what he was putting out there in a way that was not disclosing more classified information and explaining extremely technical and highly technical concepts. Uh, and I tell you, we were, as your question indicates, woefully insufficient at our ability to communicate what we were and what we weren't doing because both being constrained by explaining things without the benefit of disclosing more classified information or confirming things that he was putting out um, and because it's complex stuff. So um, I fear that the government will always be in the kind of losing position on this. But, you know, it's kind of a woe is me situation. That's the, that's the job of government, right? To get better at explaining that. Um, and I, look, the, the thing from the Snowden experience was um, it did force us to look very hard at what we needed to continue to classify and whether we could be saying more about what we were doing. Uh, and it shifted our orientation, quite frankly. Uh, and it was uh, hard going uh, to move the government and the intelligence community to say, you know what, let's really think hard. Do we need to keep all of this under wraps? Can we talk more about why we're doing what we're doing, how we're doing it? Can we think harder about this? And, and um, uh, be more transparent, not, as other people have heard me say this today, earlier today, not transparency for transparency's sake, but transparency in service of letting the American people understand why the government is doing what it's doing, steps it's taking. You can agree or disagree, but hopefully that lends some legitimacy and confidence in the steps that we're taking for national security. Um, because if we don't have that confidence of the American people in the steps we're taking, we will, we've lost the battle before we've even taken it to the adversary. Um, if I could just return back to the drones um, for this question. Um, because drones don't put U.S. troops in danger of casualties, um, they're inherently going to be less pro protested um, by the home front. Um, and so um, I just wanted to ask if you think there's a danger of overuse and over-reliance on drones simply because they are um, easier for politicians to convey as mm -hmm. um, endangering less American troops' lives. Yeah, look, I think this is one of the complex set of factors that have gone into the policy I, I talked about earlier. Lots of reasons to impose that policy framework I talked about. One is setting some norms because this is technology that other countries um, that don't have our laws and values uh, and don't espouse them, uh, that they're gonna use that tool, so let's try and set some norms. Uh, the other is um, not being 
overly reliant on this tool, which, which has a, you know, it can be kind of antiseptic, right, in terms of you've got a safe distance from, um, from this use of force. Uh, and you don't want to get so comfortable in that that you're not thinking about the second, third, fourth order effects of what happens. Going uh, to uh, the other question here about, well, does it end up radicalizing local communities? Does it risk mm -hmm. backlash? What impact does it have? These are the, you know, Dan and his colleagues in the State Department, we regularly would have this discussion. Well, what will be the impact on our relationship with the government of that country, with its intelligence and security services, <coughs> whose cooperation we need on a whole host of issues and threats, right? So all of that has to be factored in um, as we are using a tool that I do believe is important to addressing <coughs> terrorist threats uh, going forward. Lisa, thanks, thanks for coming, um, and thank you for your service, of course. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Shaver. I'm a postdoc here, um, an occasional guest lecturer on other topics, including, terrorist, uh, including terrorism. Um, and I will admit to being one of the academics who was kind of pushed on this sort of statistical analysis, bathtubs killing more people mm -hmm. than. Um, yeah. but, 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 um, but one reason I've done so, and I, and I think the, the sort of broader issue here is the following. Um, I very much take your point that even 110 lives lost a year in terrorism is, is 110 too many. Um, and when you talk about how do you sort of explain that to the family member. But on the flip side of that is the sort of discussion of how do you communicate to family members of individuals who have been killed in a whole variety of other um, potentially solvable or mm -hmm. reducible uh, ways, diabetes and so forth, um, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. How do you justify to them, and I'm not, posing this question to you, but just sort of rhetorically, um, mm -hmm. you know, we might have been able to save your family member's life and tens and potentially, you know, potentially tens of thousands of others had we not invested the countless billions we have in terrorism, but at least invested like some fraction of that mm -hmm. in other areas. And so the discussion that I don't often see taking place, you know, we often have this terrorism sort of discussion in isolation, the mm -hmm. discussion that I don't see taking place, and, and I'm curious for your thoughts on, on sort of where the government may or may not sort of come up short on this regard is the discussion between sort of groups, not only to say how do we prioritize across a variety of national security threats, but if the role of government is not only to minimize fear, but to kind of reduce lives and so forth, how do we prioritize in terms of budgeting across these areas? Hmm. So uh, this is the issue that we confronted in, for instance, talking about um, where should we be on our Afghanistan policy? Right? This was very real, and actually uh, President Obama talked about this and he gave speeches about this, right? The literally weighing, well, we are spending in lives and treasure on um, a very important mission uh, in Afghanistan, but if we didn't spend that or reduce that by X amount, you know, We've got all these other priorities. And that literally was part of the discussions about how should we think about weighing our responsibilities as we, you know, as President Obama talked about trying to wind down two wars, right? Um, so I don't have a good answer other than to say that is exactly the types of considerations you have as president, right? I mean, I described at the outset of this my um, uh, third week on the job and what was on my plate. But that was this fraction of what was on the president's plate on any given day, right? So I'm describing for him and bringing him all that bad news in my bucket of responsibilities. But I was blissfully ignorant about the trade deficit and healthcare policy and you name it, right? So that is the definition of leadership is thinking about those trade-offs. Uh, back in the summer, uh, former Defense Secretary Perry was here and gave a talk. And he presented uh, some uh, animations uh, regarding uh, nuclear risks, including the risk of a rogue uh, small nuclear uh, uh, attack. Yeah. 
which were very plausible, uh, perhaps more plausible than 9-11. And I wonder uh, what you thought at the time when you were in office and what you think now is that risk. Mm -hmm. um, the, the risk of both a nation state, i.e. North Korea, right, it's, uh, as well as a non-state actor getting hold of a weapon of mass destruction is the nightmare scenario, is the, is the top risk that we worry about, right? Because of, albeit low probability, but catastrophic consequence, right? And it's the reason why um, President, then President Obama said to then President-elect Trump, North Korea is the most urgent, most immediate national security issue that you face. For exactly, for exactly that reason. So uh, I guess I, I don't want our discussion here today to say that um, that is not a risk uh, that wasn't always front of mind. Um, it, mercifully, um, you know, we don't have the equivalent of examples of San Bernardino, Boston Marathon that, that allow us to have these conversations. Thank God uh, we're not talking about those same issues vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a WMD, but um, the, the, the danger of, for instance, North Korea's steady march to uh, have a capability to threaten the homeland um, is the, the most urgent threat that we face, and we communicated that uh, to President-elect Trump at the time. So if you're talking about portable, the portable risk, the portable oh, risk. Oh, I mean, it's a, it is a, um, it's a follow-on, right? Um, the, the ability the, to um, have material that is obtainable by a either rogue state or non-state actor, um, you know, all of that is, I think, part and parcel. I reference North Korea because if you've got uh, the capability um, and the material uh, and a market for it, uh, you know, uh, and a rogue actor, whether in state or a non-state um, uh, capacity, that is going to be a factor in our concern about a, the so-called loose nuke scenario. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> some surveys have showed that there are uh, quite a significant number of people uh, in Middle Eastern countries, you know, integer percentages, uh, 5, 10, 15 percent, uh, that have uh, sympathies towards uh, some of the things that terrorist organizations do. Um, and so, you know, for instance, uh, Amer deployment of American troops uh, in the Middle East, uh, the concerns about westernization of their culture. Uh, so you mentioned earlier you had that, you know, unique program to uh, debunk the myths of ISIS and target, you know, teenagers who might be susceptible to that kind of marketing, go after people who might actually become terrorists or might become actively involved. But uh, how do we communicate kind of the greater American strategy, our needs and our visions to allay these concerns, not just to you know, show how terrible these terrorist organizations are, but in general try to win the hearts and minds of these broader populaces who may have concerns about what the United States is doing? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we have to communicate that through our policy and our values. It's about you know, how we carry out our counterterrorism uh, policies. It's about how we articulate our vision of United States leadership in the role, uh, world. It's about how we envision um, uh, the Muslim world and our Gulf uh, partners. Uh, you know, it's about uh, prioritizing working with, um, for instance, on a counter messaging with the, the Emiratis, right? So we, one of the things we did was create a counter messaging center, not you know, in Washington, D.C., but in the Emirates, right? And have that be the locus for the counter-messaging. So I think you've got to do it across all of these spaces. Um, and it's about how we talk in our diplomacy um, about what is our role vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, wanting to have an inclusive government, say, in Iraq, right? And that that be the condition precedent for whether or not we go in in 2014 to push back ISIS. Uh, we did it only after 
um, we were satisfied that then President Abadi would um, show some measure of inclusiveness and addressing of Sunni grievances. The failure to address which by the Maliki government was one of the reasons ISIS, I think, was able to roll over uh, the Sunni heartland in Iraq. So I think you've got to do it across all those pieces. Okay, well, I, I have one question I'd like to ask in closing. <laughs> I don't want to go over our time. Um, Lisa, think back. Uh, it's uh, your junior year in college. Did you have any <laughs> idea whatsoever that you would wind up being uh, uh, in government, uh, at the Justice Department, at the White House, working the law, working as a public servant? No, I thought I was going to go be an English professor somewhere. <laughs> that worked out really Is, well. Yeah, in the English department. Where are they today? <laughs> yeah. uh, no. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Emphatically, no. <laughs> and so reflect back uh, for the benefit of students who may be thinking about it on the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the gratifications of public service, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, something we at the Dickey Center are always trying to underscore. But, um, you know, you're closer to it. You, you, you haven't been a public servant for just a matter of months now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, no, I did not know. Uh, and if you had told me uh, 10 years ago that... Uh, five, six, eight years ago that I would, you know, be counterterrorism advisor to the president, I would have said you're nuts. If you'd told me, um, you know, years before that, that I would be serving the attorney general, the director of the FBI, none of that was predicted. So the, I guess the, the first thing I would say is I have been extraordinarily fortunate, ridiculously so, quite frankly, in the, um, the opportunities I've had to serve. Uh, and at each time that I thought I would go uh, and leave government and go do something else, I had another uh, really uh, exceptional uh, opportunity to do something interesting in government. So if you have the opportunity, um, I urge you, I implore you <laughs> to go into public service. Um, and, you know, regardless of the moment you may believe that we're in, regardless of where you are on certain policy uh, choices, of the Obama administration, the Trump administration, whatever, you know, the government needs experts. They need dedicated uh, people across the scope, right? I mean, in my job in the White House, the vast, vast majority of the staff on my team were career experts in foreign policy, in intelligence, in law enforcement, uh, you name it. And they served across administrations. And thank God that they did. Because then we had, when we were sitting around the Situation Room table, real expertise to draw on, real facts to wrestle with, real subject matter experts to uh, feed into and supply the fodder for uh, policy choices that got made. And they were hopefully informed ones. Whatever you think about the choices, and we should have that debate, uh, I hope that um, the, the message that comes across is that there were choices informed by facts and experts and rigorous analysis. Uh, and that's the most important thing. And you don't get that without having uh, people willing to serve. And then the last thing I'd say is I get asked a lot you know, by uh, students of all ages, you know, um, what do I have to do to get X job? What should I be doing to get Y job? Um, and I, what I say to people is, you should be liberated by what I'm about to say, which is, you are not not doing something you should be doing, which is to say there's no path, there's no kind of checklist that you need to be satisfying other than do really well in uh, Professor Benjamin's course, Professor Walford's course, and you know, so do well. Um, but focus on the... Uh, less about the, what you're doing than working with and for people you respect. Because that is ultimately uh, what I kind of draw upon my experience. I was extraordinarily fortunate to have mentors and people I respected who kind of took me under their wing, who I could look at and emulate and really value seeing how they were serving with integrity. Uh, and it gave me something to try and shoot for. Well, that's a great note to end on, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I particularly want to thank our guests. <laughs>